<laughs> Greetings to all my friends and colleagues at OPI from Calgary. My name is Alan Phillips, consulting geologist, and I'm going to speak to you today on the early beginnings of the Canadian oil industry with emphasis on oil springs and petroleum. Our story starts in the 1850s, the middle of the 19th century. What you're looking at here is a, a map of Canada West. You'll remember uh, Confederation is not going to happen for another 17 years. So the country of Canada and the province of Ontario don't exist in the 1850s. We're looking at Canada West, which was formerly uh, Upper Canada, and our focus is going to be on the Enniskillen gum beds, which are highlighted on the map. We're about an hour's drive west of London, Ontario, and just southeast of the port of Sarnia. Our story starts in 1851 with then assistant geologist with the Geologic Survey of the province of Canada, Alexander Murray. He's sent by the director, William Edmund Logan, to examine the asphaltic deposits in Enniskillen Township. These are in the backwoods of Lambton County in the swamp. And he reports back that he's noted the extent, and he's also commented that the deposits have an associated seepages of petroleum. It's interesting to note that the assistant geologist is from the Woodstock area. Our story leaps forward to 1852. The brothers Charles Nelson and Henry Tripp, also from the Woodstock area, form a company called the International Mining and Manufacturing Company. Their business plan is to dig up the surface bitumen deposits, boil them in large cast iron pots or maple syrup kettles, and collect the residue tarry asphalt and the focus of their efforts is to use that asphalt for road paving and sealing the hulls of ships. Unfortunately, their business plan is faulty. Uh, it's very difficult to transport the finished product out of the backwoods of Lambton County and get it to market. So by no surprise, in 1856, they are in bankruptcy and they're forced to sell the interest in their gum beds. They owe money to a wagon maker in Hamilton, Ontario, James Miller Williams. And upon hearing about the gum beds, he sends for a sample and sends it to two uh, noted chemists who uh, look at the sample and their determination is the light ends that the Tripp brothers have boiled off is the more valuable part. The naphtha or kerosene that's boiled off makes an excellent uh, illuminating fluid if you put it in your oil lamp and the grease or light uh, oil is great for lubricating machinery. So this excerpt from Thomas Gale's 1860 publication, The Wonder of the 19th Century, Rock Oil in Pennsylvania and Elsewhere, uh, describes what uh, Williams did once he obtains these leases. Williams and Company well is dug 49 feet the dimension of the well is about seven by nine feet square, and it's cribbed with small logs to keep it from caving in. It does not extend to the rock, but oil rises within 10 feet of the top of the well, which contains, in their estimation, 13,724 gallons or 343 barrels of oil. It's been in operation for over two years. The largest amount taken from the well at present time is about 1,500 gallons or 37 barrels with a hand pump, and it takes 10 hours to pump it out. That leaves about 350 barrels still in the well. Now, the interesting thing here is that they've been producing oil for two years in 1860, which makes the Miller-Williams well predates the Pennsylvania discovery by Colonel Drake. Production of oil continues in the uh, oil springs area. It takes an exciting turn in 1861 with John Shaw. These excerpts are from John McLaurin's sketches in crude oil. John Shaw at the time is a loner. He's built a cheap rig and provided spring coal and kick down to drill the wells. He's toiling alone and his weary task has tapped him out for money, credit and courage. As the story goes, on the last day, he's decided that he will leave Enniskillen Township if he doesn't discover oil on this day, and he lets down his tools and resumes drilling. 
20 minutes later, a rush of gas drove the tools high out of the air, followed in the next instance by a column of oil that rose 100 feet. The roar could be heard a mile and startled the populace of nearby oil springs, and they congregated to see this unexpected marvel. Options differ as to the actual production of this novel strike. Best judge placed it at 5,000 barrels a day for two or three weeks. And this has created quite a stir. It's attracted uh, a professor of geology, zoology, and botany from the University of Michigan, Alexander Winchell, uh, in his 1870 publication, Sketches of Creation, devotes an entire chapter to something about oil. Though Western Pennsylvania has produced numerous flowing oil wells of wonderful capacity, there is no quarter of the world where the production has attained such prodigious dimensions as in 1862 upon Oil Creek in the township of Enniskillen in soon to be named Ontario. The first flowing well was struck on January 11th, 1862. That would be the Shaw Gusher. And before October, no less than 35 wells had commenced to drain a storehouse which provident nature had occupied untold thousands of years filling for the uses and not for the amusement of men. So you can see by Winchell's discussion here that there's some 35 wells flowing oil in uh, Enniskillen Township. Winchell also describes these flowing wells vary in amount of oil. Some flow 300 to 600 barrels a day, others 1,000, uh, some 3,000 barrels a day. Three wells are reported to flow over 6,000 barrels a day. And the one well, the Black and Matheson well, flow oil at a rate of about 7,500 barrels a day. These early oil hunters get their first lesson in economics. The chart on the right is the price of oil from 1859 to 1900. You can see when the wells were originally drilled in the 1800s, 1861, the price of oil is over $10 a barrel. With this flood of new oil, not only here in Enniskillen Township, but also to the south in Pennsylvania with the Drake well, the price of oil plummets to 10 cents a barrel. These early producers have no way of shutting in their wells. So now the oil is escaping and it's floating down Black Creek into the tributaries of the Lake St. Clair, and finally into the west basin of Lake Erie, covering it in oil. So not only is this an economic and uh, environmental problem, what happens is it depletes the oil springs reservoir so that uh, these are the last flowing wells that will ever be drilled in oil springs. From now on, oil will have to be pumped out of the ground. We'll go from the historic side to the geologic side. The map on your right is from Bruce Bailey, Bob Cochran's report in 1985. It is a structure map on the top of the Devonian carbonate. In this corner of Ontario will be the Dundee limestone. And you can see the pools of oil springs and petroleum and others plotted on this map. You'll notice that oil springs sits on an anticline or a positive feature with the type well, the Imperial 831 well in, in a skillin with the uh, red star. The petrolia field to the north is much larger and uh, will be discussed in a few minutes. Bob and Bruce calculate that the oil springs pool covers an area of about 1,121 acres and is an estimated of over 24 million barrels of oil in place. I'll next show you a schematic and a cross section that runs west to east across the oil springs pool on this cross section, you're looking at the Devonian and Silurian section from top to bottom. The uh, brown is the drift or mud at the top of the well. The gray at the very top of the section are the Devonian shales. The purple color is the Devonian carbonates. And below that is the Silurian section, which includes the Bass Island and the Salina section with the Guelph at the base. The green on the cross section are the salts within the Silurian salt section deeper. And you can see they pinch and swell. Unfortunately, we don't have any log data on the uh, oil springs pool, which is in the center of the cross section there. So we've got a bit of a gap. I uh, point your attention to the schematic done by Lazaric and Carter in 2008, which simplifies this. 
and shows the uh, yellow salina group, which includes the salts, pinching and swelling. And you can see the overlying Devonian carbonates also follow that pinch and swell with the oil being trapped at the very top of these anticline traps. If we look at the well on the cross section in the center there, the imperial well, we'll use that as a type well for the oil springs oil pool. Here's our type well. In the 1960s, Imperial Oil came back in 100 years after the pool was discovered and drilled a couple of uh, test wells. They were looking at potential of enhanced oil recovery of these Devonian oil pools. The Imperial 831 and a Skillen well in plot 18 concession one is the type well I've got. Uh, you see the gamma ray neutron log. On the left side of the log, you see the cord interval marked in black roughly 331 feet to 439 feet in this particular well. You'll remember the Tripp brothers in 1852 and 1854 were mining the surface deposits that had leaked out to the surface. In 1858, the Williams well was dug to a depth of 49 feet and was above the bedrock, so we'll put it in that brown drift marked on the gamma ray neutron log. Below that is the Hamilton group, we have the, the Witter beds and Rockport Quarry limestone sandwiched in between are the shale section, the Arcona and the Bell, which typically are called soap by the drillers. So the Shaw Gusser, which was drilled to a depth of 200 feet, stopped somewhere in this Hamilton group above the big lime or the Dundee Lucas formation, which is deeper. Now the oil is reservoir or housed in the Dundee Lucas formation, but uh, as indicated on the right in this 1890 report to the Royal Commission on Mineral Resources of Ontario, in the old days, some of the flowing wells were struck, and in some cases, the tools used for drilling these wells suddenly dropped where oil was struck. It is inferred that large crevices existed which held accumulations of gas and oil. So this upper Hamilton section and on up into the overlying drift is prone to fracturing, as is the Dundee and Lucas the limestones and dolomites below it. Oil is allowed to feed up these fractures right to the surface, and that's why we have oil at the surface in the Enniskill and gum beds. I've pulled some core here from the Lucas Dullestone in the base of that imperial well in lot 18 concession one. And you can see on the extreme left, the light gray dullest stones of the Lucas formation. There's a few pieces there with a bit of a brown tinge or oil staining to it. You can see it's pretty much a nondescript dullest stone with some pinpoint buggy porosity. It's not until you look at this rock under the microscope, and I've got a couple of thin section photomicrographs from the 14, 15 foot interval which shows this finely crystalline dullest stone with high microporosity, in this case, in the order of 25 to 30% porosity. If you further zoom in with a scanning electron microscope, you can actually see the contrasting sizes of the dolomite crystals in this microporosity. You can see some dolomite ROMs that are fairly coarse in the voids themselves, but the whole matrix is made up of a very fine grained dolomite crystals. The result, if you look on the chart on the right, is a plot of porosity going from zero to 35% on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis is a measure of permeability, the interconnectedness of these pores. And it goes from 0 0.01 to one Darcy on the vertical scale. If you cross plot the core porosity and permeability, you get the plot that you see the diamonds are the Lucas formation, and you can see that they tend to cluster in the higher end here with higher porosities in the 20 to 35 percent range and permeabilities in the 1 to 1,000 millidarcy range, a superior world-class reservoir. If we move north to the Petrolia field, you see it's a much larger feature, and it sits on a large anticline rollover that Bruce Bailey and Bob Cochran have mapped with their Dundee structure map. The Petrolia pool is about 9,500 acres in size and is an estimated 112 million barrels of oil in place, according to Bob and Bruce. Our Petrolia type well is the Imperial 833 well, 
in lot two concession 12 of Moore Township. And you can see the type log, the gamma ray neutron on the left-hand side of the screen. I've colored the scheme is the same. The drift is much thicker in, in this area, is the brown. The Hamilton section made up of interbedded limestones and shales include the Witter beds, the Arcona, uh, the Rockport Quarry Lime, and the Bell Shale at the base of it. And they sit on top of the uh, big lime, which would be your Dundee and Lucas formation. You can see the chord interval in this well uh, spans from the base of the uh, Hamilton section to the top of the Lucas formation. In the 1890 Royal Commission on Mineral Resources of Ontario, there's a couple of quotes that I've included with this log. Typically, wells in the petroleum field in the 1860s were drilled down in five to six days. So very efficient drillers in the petroleum field. And the cost to drill a well ranges from $150 to $160 in the 1860s. They indicate that oil is struck in the petroleum field at a depth from 465 to 473 feet. And it's stated to exist in dolomitic limestone from about two to six feet thick, brown in color, usually stained by the petroleum and very soft. You can see the pay zone highlighted in red on the neutron log in this follow-up well that Imperial drilled some hundred years later. On the right is a quote from uh, Ontario's Petroleum Legacy by Earl Gray in 2008. Petroleum got off to a slow start. There were a few wells, only 16, producing small volumes of oil as early as 1861. When the drillers returned to Petroleum after the oil springs pool had faltered and the price of oil had recovered, they had to reach deeper to find the oil. And as indicated in the Royal Commission, this depth was almost 500 feet. It was at this time that Benjamin King, a former ship captain from St. Catharines, brought in Petrolia's first great flowing oil well. In November 23, 1866, even choked back, the flow of oil through the small diameter pipe was estimated at 285 barrels a day and lasted for 41 days. If we look at the core of our uh, type well at Moore 2 of 12, we see this brown dolomitic limestone, much more heavily oil stained here. And if you look at the core plug porosities and permeabilities, you can see they're much lower than what we saw for the Lucas formation at Oil Springs. The Dundee Reservoir at Petrolia is averaging porosity of range of about 7% and permeability is less than a millidarcy at 0.98 millidarcies. So much tighter rock than what we're seeing at Oil Springs. To rectify this problem, we call upon the gentleman you see at the right of this screen, the shooter. In an effort to increase productivity on low productivity wells, the shooter's called in, and you can see in this photograph, he's pouring nitroglycerin into the torpedo, which will be lowered to the depth that the driller described as oil show. The torpedo will be lowered on wire line to that depth, the shooter will put a go devil on the wire line and drop it and run. The go devil will run down the wire line, strike the top of the torpedo, detonate the nitroglycerin, and the postcard on the left shows the result after torpedoing, oil shooting out of the well. It turns out that this treatment also helps in removing wax buildup because of these crude oils are uh, paraffin based. They tend to produce wax in the well bore, which tends to plug production and using the torpedoes, they can uh, remove this wax and get your well flowing again. So that uh, kind of wraps up the history and geology of the uh, Oil Springs Petrolia area. I just like to uh, leave off with an invite to anybody that's interested in learning more about the geology of Petrolia and Oil Springs, that uh, we're going to ship three cores from Ontario, a regional well from the uh, Ramwell and Brook, the type well at Oil Springs and the type well at Petrolia to the CF Canadian Society of Petroleum Geologists Core Conference in Calgary in June in the 23rd and 24th of this year. For those that are interested in learning more about the geology of these oil pools, I invite you to come out, uh, roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty, 
and look at the core. The CSPG will be recording my presentation on these three cores, and it will be available online for those that want to see it. If there's any questions, I'll log in uh, uh, remotely from Calgary and try to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for your time. <laughs>